All right, welcome back to the Canadian Gun Vault Behind the Vault Door. My name is Mark Morelli. I'll be your host for today's podcast. Uh, flying solo today. It's a uh, Sunday morning and I'm here at home. I've got my bowl of gluten-free rotini pasta. Yes, gluten-free. Yeah, allergies, folks, if you uh, haven't experienced them yet and you're anywhere near your 30s, they can just appear out of nowhere for those of you that actually... Uh, you know, I've experienced allergies before. They're no fun. Uh, stomach cramps, a lot of itchiness. Uh, sometimes you break out into rashes. It's crazy. A couple people in my life actually don't believe I have allergies. They think it's all in my brain. I can assure you the struggle is real. Anyway, uh, outside of shopping habits to uh, <laughs> address my special needs... Uh, we're going to be talking about a couple of different things today. Uh, first off, I'm just reading something now on the uh, CCFR uh, Facebook page. Uh, the title of the article is, After Vegas Shooting, Gun Owner Destroys His AR-15 With an Axe and Wants Them Banned. Uh, my initial reaction, uh, one, it's a stag arms. Uh, two, it looks you know to be a bit of a custom build. Uh, so here's a guy that, you know, Obviously, took a little bit of care to make this thing. I mean, it doesn't look like it's from the factory. So, uh, to turn around suddenly and to be, you know, ashamed or embarrassed of owning something because somebody else, uh, you know, did something wrong with it. I mean, I, like, I mean, is this, you know, what gun ownership looks like in the United States? I hope not. I would expect that this guy would represent a very, very small minority of people uh, that are easily influenced by the media, uh, if at all, in fact, this doesn't qualify as fake news. Uh, if there's any truth to this at all, I, I can tell you that as gun owners, we should not be ashamed of the things that we love. We should not make apologies because we like firearms and we like shooting guns. Uh, you know, over the years, I've run into a lot of people, uh, people that have uh, asked me that question, you know, why guns? You know. What is it about guns? I mean, if they don't look at you sideways and kind of, you know, treat you like the postal worker that's about to go offside, I mean, if they actually have an, an open mind uh, and they look at you and say, well, you know, why guns? You know, tell them. Tell them you enjoy it. Tell them that you find it relaxing. Tell them that you uh, love the idea of challenging yourself. Uh, tell them that you find things that are, you know, interesting. In terms of the historical significance, make movie references. Tell them, that, you know what, hey, have you ever seen Saving Private Ryan? Like, every hero in that movie was carrying this gun. Like, I mean, why would you not want to have some exposure to something like that? To be able to hold a real piece of history, you know? And I'm spending a lot of time now, and, uh, you know, certainly with the, uh, with the firearm community. And one of, the, one of the subgroups of this culture that I've grown to absolutely love is the military surplus guys. And I mean, Devin, Braden, if you're out there listening, uh, love you guys, right? Love being at the show. Uh, looking forward to uh, getting together with you and getting some shooting in. Uh, you know, I've been uh, watching some of your stuff and I'm really enjoying it. Uh, I'm thinking that, you know, uh, you know, we have a lot in common. I, I really love vintage firearms. I think that, you know, there's a lot of people out there that get into new firearms and, and, and I love new firearms too. I love all guns. If it goes bang, I'm into it. Um, you know, there are very few guns that I've ever met that I didn't like, uh, ones that don't function well can, you know, piss me off. But beyond that, uh, if it shoots straight and it functions, you know, fairly reliably, I mean, old guns have their quirks. They, uh, they tend to be, uh, sometimes a little bit temperamental. I mean, anytime you get into something that's, you know, a century old, it, it might get a little fickle on you at times and fussy as uh, black powder Dave would put it. But I can tell you right now that, uh, Hey, at a hundred years old, uh, you might be a little fussy too. So, uh, put up with it because the amount of history that goes along with firearms, uh, you know, from that age grouping is just incredible. I mean, to hold in your hands, something that, uh, a person would have held, you know, when the Titanic sank, you know, I love using, you know, that, that point, uh, time reference, you know, uh, to, to actually be able to hold something that was used, uh, during World War One, you know, and if you can imagine the great stories, you know, the, uh, the courage demonstrated by those that participated in that very ugly, uh, very gritty conflict, you know, that 
that saw for the first time ever, uh, you know, machine gun fire. I mean, if you can imagine, uh, the time before that, you got muskets, you know, single shot, uh, you know, smooth bore, uh, lead ball throwing, you know, pumpkin flying muskets, you know, and, you know, one at a time and, you know, big giant volleys of fire. And, and then some, some brave souls, you know, decided that they were going to come up with <clears throat> something a little bit different, you know, a self-contained cartridge, you know, uh, you know, you know, we still use it today, uh, you know, to, to actually have a firearm that fired, uh, you know, multiple rounds in rapid succession, you know, uh, which, which originally was designed, you know, not to mow down large groups of people, but to suppress, you know, uh, areas and to prevent people from moving so that you could get, uh, you know, your troops into a better position uh, to, to take, you know, uh, points of uh, strategic importance. Uh, so the development of machine gun fire and its use in World War I would have been just terrifying, uh, I'm sure, for soldiers of the day, much like the tank, you know, like, I mean, to actually see this giant, uh, you know, rolling metal device, you know, with machine guns on it that couldn't be stopped. I mean, it would have been horrifying. I mean, it, it would be like seeing a giant UFO today, you know, landing uh, in the city. I'm sure it would be very scary uh, for people that had never seen one before, you know, before the technology existed. When this, when this arrived on scene during World War I, I'm, I'm sure it left a very uh, large impression on those that had never seen a tank before. And uh, certainly tanks, the role of tanks in, in military uh, uh, strategic pursuits has, has changed. But uh, ultimately, you know, a tank is always going to be a very imposing uh, device on the battlefield. So you've got machine guns and you've got tanks, uh, you know, and you've got young men that are probably scared out of their minds with loved ones at home and, uh, you know, fighting for a cause and uh, just engaging in, you know, horrible things in an effort to put an end to conflict, you know, uh, we've got people that are, you know, doing things and we're asking young men to do things, uh, to this day. Uh, and I mean, hats off to the military service members out there. If we got, uh, we got a number of listeners, uh, and, uh, people that follow the Canadian gun vault that are from our Canadian military and U S military, uh, my hat goes off to you, you and law enforcement. There's, uh, there's no, there's no uh, downplaying it. I, I love you guys uh, for the things that you do, for the sacrifices you make every single day. It doesn't have to be big ones. Sometimes it's a, a combination of, you know, big ones and a multitude of small things you do every day. Uh, Got to take a moment to thank our men and women in law enforcement and in our militaries. You, uh, you really do uh, do us proud. Uh, I've got... Uh, you know, 20 years of service underneath my belt before I decided to call it quits and pursue this thing, and I I've loved it. Uh, I got to tell you, I don't regret uh, a single moment of my service uh, with the Hamilton Police Force. Uh, and I call it a force. I don't care what anybody says. Uh, <clears throat> people uh, people think that, you know, that's wrong. Uh, I, you know, I still like doing that. Uh, if it leaves an unfavorable impression in people's minds, I apologize. Uh, I'm a product of the 70s. Anyway, back to World War One. Uh, you know, to have young men, you know, and women are, are participating in this effort. Uh, you know, living their lives while engaging in, in in activities that are clearly unnatural. You know, there's the generation of a lot of stories. You know, and and firearms are part of that. And given the importance that firearms would have in people's lives, uh, then you know, their lives would depend on it. Uh, you know. I'm uh, I'm sure there uh, there's a lot of energy imparted on these uh, inanimate objects that when you hold them you feel something I I, I know I do uh, when I hold a Lee Enfield rifle from World War One and I imagine putting that uh, Puddin Bull helmet on my head which was really nothing more than a you know a slightly thicker metal colander. Uh, that was supposed to, you know, protect people's heads and, you know, grenades going off and machine gun fire being heard for the first time and, you know, dark trenches and uh, some really, really uh, hard fought battles in, uh, in very ugly environments. Uh, when I think uh, the, a young man, you know, uh, half my age, 
you know, that should be in school, you know, or walking down the street with his girlfriend, you know, enjoying a, maybe an ice cream, you know, as a luxury item back in the early 1900s. You know, when I imagine that young man sitting in that trench and he's holding that gun, I think to myself, wow, like, I mean, that's adversity. You know, that's, that's the kind of thing that we should really respect. You know, uh, people's feelings being hurt on the internet, uh, you know, the overly sensitive populations that we seem to have to uh, cater to with enthusiasm today, uh, they wouldn't last two minutes in that kind of environment. I, I, I highly doubt even at my age I would. Uh, I, I could tell you that if you've got, you know, young men, 19-year-old boys in holes, in the dark, you know, uh, defending themselves with what we today would call completely archaic uh, weaponry and technology. I mean, that, that's real courage. And, and it's not the kind of thing that should be forgotten. I mean, it certainly isn't the kind of thing that we should only celebrate once a year. You know, I love, I love Remembrance Day. I, I think that it's a, a wonderful, it's a wonderful day and, and certainly one that needs to be uh, respected. But I think one day isn't quite enough for the sacrifices that have been made and the ones that are still being made by our, our militaries. You know, they, they live uncomfortable lives. I, I, I wouldn't want to be on the other side of the world, uh, you know, on my drive to work, worrying about an ID blowing up uh, underneath my vehicle, you know, or a sniper fire or, you know, every day, uh, you know, sweating. <laughs> So much that I have to drink, you know, a dozen bottles of water. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure my dietitian would think that that's a good idea. But uh, <laughs> spending spending time in those kinds of environments, I mean, I can't imagine that. Uh, you know, that's that's got to be fun. Uh, and yet they do it, and they do it be, not because they're told to do it. Uh, I can tell you that you know all the military service members I've met uh, usually feel a real sense of duty. And I think it's really important to respect that and to, uh, to acknowledge that. And I, and I certainly will do that here. Uh, you're going to hear me talk about it uh, once in a while. Uh, I'm going to speak about the militaries because I, I am coming into contact with them more and more. Uh, they are part of the community. But they're intrinsically tied to the military surplus collectors uh, because these are the men that really appreciate, men and women. I, I'm starting to encounter more girls uh, that appreciate history and want to feel that strong connection uh, to the past. I, I'm, I'm meeting more and more of them every day. And there's been this resurgence uh, of interest in all things uh, retro in general, in Canadian culture and in Western culture. Uh, in, in the firearm community is no different. Certainly the page is a great indication of that. You know, things are, uh, things are really picking up. Uh, you know, the success of the page, uh, I'd be amiss if I didn't say in large part was due to the uh, giant interest in military and surplus firearms. And the people I'm meeting are just incredible. Uh, you know, spent a little time with uh, my boy DJ. Uh, kid's built like a truck. Uh, he has high hopes of being a police officer. I, I can't really discourage him from that. He's got that look in his eye. He's, he's going to do it no matter what. And I remember I, I had that look once upon a time too. So I think it's fantastic. I mean, uh, to see a young man motivated like that. But uh, as well, he has this incredible interest in uh, World War I and World War II vintage firearms. And, I mean, he, he knows the stories that go with the guns. He understands the technological advancements, you know, that were made, the evolution of the firearms, uh, you know, in terms of their user friendliness and the efforts that were made to kind of improve the designs over the years. And, and you know, like, I mean, he really... He really does, you know, know what he's uh, talking about, which is really something that I'm seeing more and more is people are, are doing the reading. They're not just getting out onto the range. They're doing the reading and they're making, you know, making reference to uh, the historical significance and, and where these items, you know, uh, were used. And, and, and I mean, the interest extends, uh, you know, far beyond that. I mean, this young man has, has traveled to Europe and walked the battlefields, you know, to be in that same space. Uh, you know, and, and I mean, how how incredible is it that a young guy like that, you know, in his early 20s uh, would have uh, such a passion for a thing? You know, uh, I certainly understand it. I get it. Uh, you know, I, some might argue I have it myself. I don't know. 
there's there's a lot of work that goes in, in, into doing what I do here. Uh, but but really, uh, ultimately, I have this passion for the firearm community, and and, and that's that's kind of what's driving me here. Uh, for those of you that wonder maybe why, and I, I don't talk about this much, but uh, I, I guess I better at some point. Uh, the real reason that I started this was because I love the firearm community. I, I love the people in it. I love the guns. Uh, you know, I see a need for a, a clear voice in our community that can articulate what it is that we love and present it to the mainstream public so that they're not scared shitless. Uh, you know, for, for 80% of the population, they may, may or may not have any strong feelings about guns, but if they're not educated, if they don't know anything about them, you know, uh, they'll, they'll tend to agree with whatever laws come down the pike and are be, you know, be easily swayed into believing that the government is doing something you know, good and productive in terms of improving public safety. Uh, I think that it would only be fair to put our side out there. And that's something that really hasn't been done before. Uh, you know, certainly over the years, I've seen a lot of people uh, that have, you know, hidden their passion, hidden their pastime, their lifestyle. And that's really what it becomes for a lot of people. It's not, it's not just, you know, going to the gun store, buying some bullets and pulling the trigger and watching some, you know, things break. It, it's, it's not, you know, uh, grabbing your shotgun and going out into the bush and trying to find a duck and, and, you know, bringing it home for dinner. Uh, there's just so much more to it than that. There's, you know, this subculture of people that speak a language that 80% of the general population of Canada doesn't speak. And so it's intimidating and it's, uh, it's, it's difficult to sometimes uh, express to people that don't understand guns that are afraid of them what it is that we're doing. And so to, so to present it, you know, in a way that they find, you know, enjoyable in, in photography and in videos, I really, I really thought that, you know, that would be a, a fantastic start. I've always loved art and I've always loved, uh, you know, photography. So I, I picked up a camera. Uh, a couple of years ago. I mean, I had done a little bit with my cell phone, um, you know, some items from my own personal collection. And uh, then, of course, I started spending a little time at the range and uh, taking pictures of my guns at the range. And then, you know, other people jumped on board and they saw what I was doing and, and seemed to appreciate it. And because I always insisted on, you know, sharing with people what it is that I love about guns. And, uh, you know, to have people... You know, respond so uh, enthusiastically uh, to the idea of somebody you know, speaking out and saying this is this is exactly what it is that we love about guns and to cross uh, you know cross uh, barriers and, and and go from one discipline to the next you know I kind of got to know everybody uh, at least in my own you know small circles and, and I mean I'm, I'm gradually branching out now into uh, to other clubs waiting for some invitations uh, anybody that wants to uh, perhaps host the Canadian Gun Vault at their gun club uh, and meet some of their people there. Love to have you contact me at the Canadian Gun Vault Inc. at gmail.com uh, and or you can contact me by way of Instagram or Facebook. You know, I'm constantly on those uh, those forums of social media. I, like, I really love the idea of starting to move around. Uh, I've got in open invitations to go all over the place in the States. Love you guys down in Galveston. <laughs> Texas, I'm coming. I promise. Uh, don't uh, don't worry. It's it's gonna happen at some point. Uh, Big Robert, we're gonna have you up here. Uh, you know, <laughs> American gunman, right? Love you. Right? You know what? Really looking forward to doing a little bit of sea doing with you next summer uh, and getting a little bit of shooting in Canadian style. Uh, and uh, you know, with any luck, I'll be able to make the trips uh, down to the U.S. at some point and spend a little bit of time with you guys too. Uh, you can enjoy a little Canadian hospitality and, uh, I'm not afraid to jump a plane and head down your way either. So at some point we're going to do that. But, uh, in any event, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm spending time at the gun show and I'm meeting these crazy kids. I mean, they're great guys. And then I realized they can shoot. So, uh, for the people that spend a lot of time on Instagram, uh, hoser gun guy and, uh, you know, Canadian, Canadian war warlord. Uh, we're definitely going to be getting in some shooting sometime soon. I'm really looking forward to bringing some steel with you. Uh, we're going to head over to Galt. Uh, I want you to bring your favorite military surplus rifles. Haven't done a K98 yet. Hint, hint. Uh, if you got something uh, that you think would be a good shooter, 
uh, if you've got uh, an SVT-40, perhaps, and some home-loaded ammunition, because we do not allow the use of steel core ammo at the Galt uh, Sportsman's Club, uh, would love to get those two out. If you have access to them, uh, bring them along, and uh, we'll uh, get a little plink in it. Anyway, that's about all the time I have for this podcast. Uh, I've got to get myself out the door. Uh, like most days, I find myself rushing in and out quite a bit, and uh, today is no different. So I hope you've all had the uh, enjoyable weekend. Can't wait to talk to you again, and have yourself a great day.